Now let's go to the next video, which is video number three on summary judgment. Summary judgments, uh, these are covered by Rule 35, and there are two kinds. First is summary judgment for the claimant, and second is summary judgment for the defending party. Yung summary judgment for the claimant, that is governed by Section 1. And here, let's read the provision, no? A party seeking to recover upon a claim, counterclaim, or cross-claim, or to obtain a declaratory relief may, at any time after the pleading in answer that has been served, move with supporting affidavits, depositions, or admissions for a summary judgment in his or her favor upon all or any part thereof. So, Balik lang tayo dun sa first slide. I underlined the phrase after the pleading in answer there to has been served. So, para sa claimant, pwede lang siyang mag-file ng motion for summary judgment after the responsive pleading has been served. Hindi man lang has been filed, has been served. Okay? And uh, let us examine here the first part of that provision, it says, a party seeking to recover upon a claim, counterclaim, or cross-claim, or to obtain a declaratory relief. So, sino yung party who is seeking to recover upon a claim? That's the plaintiff. How about the party seeking to recover upon a counterclaim or cross-claim? That's the defendant. So, here you can see, the defendant may move for summary judgment as a claimant under Section 1, if he is moving for summary judgment with respect to his counterclaim or cross-claim. Okay? And yung declaratory relief naman, that is uh, for the petitioner in a petition for declaratory relief to take action upon. Okay? So, kaya ko yung underline yung phrase, after the pleading in answer there to has been served, because there is a big difference between summary judgment for the claimant and summary judgment for the defending party, which we will be seeing when we talk about Section 2. And then another word that I want to emphasize here is the word move. Kaya ako, nilagyan ko ng circle yung salitang move because that means there has to be a motion filed in Section 1, filed by the claiming party. Now, that motion will not be a simple motion. There has to be supporting documents. And what are these? You have the supporting affidavits, and then you have the depositions, and then you have the admissions. And these must be in his or her favor, and it may uh, refer to all of the claims or some part of the claim or some of the claims. Okay, kaya makikita natin later on, pwedeng partial motion for summary judgment. Okay, now let's go to Section 2. Ito namang Section 2 talks about summary judgment for the defending party. So it says, A party against whom a claim, counterclaim, or cross-claim is asserted or a declaratory relief is sought may, at any time, move with supporting affidavits, depositions, or admissions for a summary judgment in his or her favor as to all or any part thereof. So katulad nung... Uh, summary judgment for the claimant, this one, there has to be a motion also. Kaya lang yung timetable niya at any time. Bakit? Kasi the issues have already been joined. May defendant ka na, may respondent ka na. So, there's no more time. There's no more need to wait for any answer because there is already a defendant, okay, who has already uh, raised a... Uh, who has already raised a counterclaim or cross-claim, okay? So, in this particular situation, it may be filed anytime. Now, let's go to Section 3. Motion and proceedings there. So, sabi natin, kailangan may motion no? for summary judgment. The motion shall cite the supporting affidavits, depositions, or admissions, and the specific law relied upon. Itong motion isa cite niya yung evidence kasi ang evidence nito yung supporting affidavits, depositions, or admissions. And not only that, the law that he relies upon so that he can get the judgment in his favor must also be cited in a motion. And then the adverse party may file a comment and serve opposing affidavits, depositions, or admissions. Anong timetable? 
non-extendable period of five calendar days from the time he receives the motion. Okay, so, hindi na kailangan uh, mag-issue ng order yung court kung kailan siya magpa-file ng sarili niyang answer. Dapat, alam na niya, it must be five calendar days from receipt of the motion. Now, is it necessary for the court to conduct a hearing? Well, the answer is no, kasi sabi nung uh, continuation ng provision na to, unless the court orders the conduct of a hearing, judgment sought shall be rendered forthwith, immediately, if the pleadings, supporting affidavits, depositions, and admissions on file show that except as to the amount of damages, there is no genuine issue as to any material fact and that the moving party is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. So, ano mangyayari dun sa damages? Yun lang matitira na subject ng litigation. That's the only matter that has to be proven during the trial. It is possible for the summary judgment to be only partial. I mentioned that a while ago. Now, how does this happen? It can happen when there are several issues, some of which are genuine and some of which are not. And this is the situation referred to in Section 4. So, Section 4, case not fully adjudicated on motion. If on motion under this rule, judgment is not rendered upon the whole case or for all the relief sought and a trial is necessary, the court may, by examining the pleadings and the evidence before it and by interrogating counsel, okay, note, counsel yung tatanungin ng court, okay, a certain what material facts exist without substantial controversy, including the extent to which the amount of damages or other relief is not in controversy, and direct such further proceedings in the action as are just. The facts so ascertained shall be deemed established, and the trial shall be conducted on the controverted facts accordingly. So in other words, Yung facts which are clearly uh, proven by the pleadings and the attached uh, evidence, the court will decide on that. The facts for which there is a doubt, that shall be the subject of a trial. <clears throat> Take note also, the rules provide for specific forms for affidavits and supporting documents. Specific, There is a specific rule on the form. And then number two, there is a sanction for affidavits in bad faith in section 6. So let's take a look at section 5. Form of affidavits and supporting papers. Important, no? Supporting and opposing affidavits shall be made on personal knowledge. Why? Because it is supposed to take the place of testimony. Okay? And it shall set forth facts as would be admissible in evidence. Meaning, anong big sabihin ng admissible in evidence? Well, all, all the rules of admissibility on evidence must be observed. Yung hindi here say yung evidence. Okay? O kaya, nandyan yung best evidence rule. Sinusunod niya lahat ng mga requirements ng rules of court. And, shall show affirmatively that the affiant is competent to testify as to the matter stated therein. Ibig sabihin, hindi here say evidence. The defendant, I mean the affiant, has personal knowledge of the contents of his affidavit. And then also, important, certify true copies of all papers or parts thereof referred to in the affidavit shall be attached thereto or served therewith. Kasi, yun na nga yung pinaka-evidence na. There will be no more trial, so there, there must be certified true copies. And you have to remember the rules on certified true copies in the rules on evidence. The custodian of the document must be the one who will issue the certification that this copy is a true and faithful reproduction of the original. Now, we have a good illustrative case on a summary judgment, and that is Wood Technology Corporation, Shi Tim Cordova, and Robert Yong King Yang, Petitioners, versus Equitable Banking Corporation, a 2005 case. This case originated from a complaint for sum of money filed before the Regional Trial Court by Equitable Banking Corporation against Wood Technology Corporation, Chi Tim Cordova, and Robert Yong King Yang. So, ito, sum of money, pinahiram ng Equitable Bank ang Wood Technology, pero nandyan din si Cordova and Yang kasi they signed as shorties. Okay, so ito, 
The complaint alleged that on December 9, 1994, WTC, Wood Technology Corporation, obtained a loan from the bank in the amount of $75,000 with interest at 8.75% per annum. And there is a promissory note to prove this loan. The promissory note was signed by Cordova and Young as representatives of WTC. Kasi di ba, corporation. So somebody has to sign on behalf of the corporation. So pagdating sa promissory note, they did not sign it in their personal capacity. Kaya lang, in addition to signing the promissory note, they also signed a surety agreement where they bound themselves as sureties of the company for the loan. So in that situation, pagdating sa surety, they signed in their personal capacities. Now, Equitable made a final demand on April 19, 1996 for the company to pay its obligation. The company and the sureties did not pay. The bank prayed that they be ordered to pay 75,603.65 US dollars, computed as of a certain date, plus interest, penalty, attorney's fees, and other expenses of litigation and costs of suit. Okay, so tingnan natin, paano in-answer ng defendants yung complaint? Sabi ng defendants, WTC obtained the $75,000 loan. So, inamin nila yung loan. And then also, that Cordova and Young bound themselves as sureties. So they admitted the, their capacity as sureties. And they claimed that only one demand letter dated April 19, 1996 was made by Equitable. So they admitted that they received the demand letter. And then they added that the promissory note did not provide the due date for payment. Okay? They also claimed that the loan had not yet matured as the maturity date was purposely left blank to be agreed upon by the parties at a later date. And since there was no maturity date, the filing of the complaint was premature and it failed to state a cause of action. But you have to remember that in obligations and contracts, when there is a demand, that in effect, in effect, that in effect fixes the, the date in which the obligation becomes due and demandable. Okay? And also, when the complaint is filed, the, it's the same thing. And then the defendants further claim that the promissory note and surety agreements were contracts of adhesion with terms on interest, penalty, charges, and attorney's fees that were excessive, unconscionable, and not reflective of the party's real intent. And then they prayed for the reformation of the promissory note and surety agreement to make the terms and conditions fair, just, and reasonable. And then they ask for payment of damages by way of a counterclaim. So, ang ginawa ng bank, on, on May 5, 1997, it moved for a judgment on the pleadings. The RTC ruled in its favor. On appeal, the Court of Appeals affirmed the RTC's judgment. Now, the issue, uh, the propriety and validity of a judgment on the pleadings. Sabi ng Supreme Court, Judgment on the pleadings is proper when an answer fails to tender an issue or otherwise admits the material allegations of the adverse party's pleading. In this case, the RTC and Court of Appeals recognize that issues were raised by the defendants in their answer before the trial court. So apparently, there were issues raised by the answer. Kaya lang, pag pinag-aralan mo yung answer, uh, hindi talaga genuine yung issues na ni-raise nila. In other words, they tried to make it appear that there was a contention, that they had some legal position that was uh, opposite to that of the bank. But, if you study the tenor of the answer, they are really not gen uh, genuine issues because they are not really contesting anything. So, here in this case, the Supreme Court define the meaning of genuine issue. According to the court, it is an issue of fact which calls for the presentation of evidence as distinguished from an issue which is fictitious or contrived, an issue that does not constitute a genuine issue for trial. So, issue, genuine issue siya kapag kailangan mag-present ng evidence. Kapag hindi kailangan ng evidence siya, then there is no genuine issue because 
wala nang kailangan i-prove factually. Now, the Supreme Court continued, we note that this is a case for sum of money. And with technology, Cordova and Young have admitted that they obtained the loan. They also admitted the due execution of the loan documents and that they received the final demand letter made by the bank. These were all attached to the complaint. Now, the three defendants merely claim that the obligation has not matured. So, hindi nila dinadena yung obligation. Ang sinasabi lang, hindi nag-mature. Notably, based on the promissory note, the RTC and Court of Appeals found this defense not a factual issue for trial because the loan was payable on demand. And the Supreme Court said we are bound by this factual finding because the Supreme Court is not a trier of facts. So, they are bound by whatever findings of fact are made by the trial court and the court of appeals. Now, when the bank made its demand, the obligation matured. So, that's a principle in obligations and contracts. This matter, preferred as a defense, could be resolved judiciously by plain resort to the stipulations in the promissory note, which was already before the trial court. A full-blown trial to determine the date of maturity of the loan is not necessary. Also, the act of leaving blank the maturity date of the loan did not necessarily mean that the parties agreed to fix it later. If this was the intention of the parties, they should have so indicated in the promissory note, but they did not show such an intention. So, and then, of oh, the good technology, Cordova and Yang also insisted that their defense tendered a genuine issue when they claimed that the loan documents constituted a contract of adhesion. Pero, hindi nila pinakita what is uh, oppressive or unfair in the contract. They did not show any ambiguity in the loan document. And the rule is that, should there be ambiguities in a contract of adhesion, such ambiguities are to be construed against the party that prepared it. But if the stipulations are clear and leave no doubt on the intention of the parties, the literal meaning of its stipulations must be held controlling. Okay? So, that's our discussion on summary judgment. And uh, we will be uh, seeing each other next time in the next video, which will be dealing with the differences between judgment on the pleadings and summary judgment. I will also be discussing some important matters about uh, summary judgment and judgment on the pleadings. See you next time.